and welcome to the Simsbury Free Library. There's a lot of faces here I haven't seen before, so there may be some people that haven't been in here or are not familiar with our building. Just quickly to let you know, this was the original library in Simsbury since um, 1874 up until the 1980s. It was built by Amos Eno, and it's now on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's a genealogical and historical research center. We also have um, other things here. We have um, Ensign Bickford rec records downstairs. We have William Eno, which is one of the sons of Amos. He's the father of transportation. He basically created all of the transportation rules we know today. This is his, um, his library area of things here. We have some books that he wrote. Um, so we have a lot of great stuff here. We're open Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we'd love you to, whenever you can, come in and visit us and see what we have here. Um, we are a nonprofit. We do rely on the, um, the donations, memberships, etc. So um, tonight, I mean, if you want, um, we consider making a donation just to help support this program and more great programs like this. There is a donation basket up front on your way out. Also, there's a survey, I believe, that was on most of your chairs. If you'd like to fill out the survey, we're, we're curious and excited to learn where you heard about this program. And also, there's this lovely salmon-colored paper that has the, um, the timeline for tonight's um, presentation. So if you did not get one and would like one, I can go there's somewhere to run the table, or I can hand these out. And so now what I would like to do is um, introduce our speaker tonight, um, Mr. Bob Bolesky. And he is a retired reference librarian and lifelong ferroequinologist. Um, he's been doing research for nearly 50 years and has given many presentations to illustrate the railroad infrastructure that once existed in the state and how the Iron Horse brought change to every community. His largest single effort is Tyler City Station, a website that he debuted in 2008. And with this website's use of photos, maps, documents, historical newspaper articles, and other materials, it's been recognized as a uniquely original and valuable source of information on state railroad history. Um, he's a member of the Connecticut Historical Society, the New Haven Railroad Historical and Technical Association, and other local historical local societies. <coughs> And from 2008 to 11, he processed the papers on the Board of Railroad Commissioners at the Connecticut State Library, unwrapping materials that had been sealed for over 150 years. Wow. <laughs> Organizing them, making them accessible to researchers for the very first time. And just recently, from 2014 to 2018, he facilitated the donation of the Ramsdale Transportation Collection to the Thompson Connecticut Historical Society. And he assembled that collection there also. He retired as Curator Emeritus in 2018. For the last several years, he served as Assistant Station Master at the Milldale Depot Museum in Southington, Connecticut, where he gives tours and is leading efforts to get the train order signal operational. Oh, I'm sorry, the train order signal operational again. Yes. There we go. Right. So perhaps anybody here can take a little trip down to Southbury, or Southington and see him there. Um, also, Bob is creating a Provincetown, Massachusetts digital railroad archive to gather materials to create awareness of the railroad century of service to the town. And another of his projects is to collect, organize, and memorialize the 4,000 photographs, mostly of railroad depots, that Lewis Herbert Benton took from 1910 to 1935. Mm -hmm. Mr. Benton captured some images that no one else ever did, but he's virtually, un uh, virtually unknown because of his reclusive nature. So that was a lot of really amazing, interesting stuff about our speaker. And so now what I'd like to do is turn it over to him and the presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Well, the time has finally come. Um, when I volunteer for these things, um, it's always kind of like the clock is ticking. Um, one month, you know, whatever, two weeks, a week, uh, and then the night before, um, a couple of days before when you realize that you didn't do this, didn't do that. <laughs> uh, what about this? You, you forgot to do, you know, contact so-and-so. But fortunately, I think everything with one possible exception has fallen into place tonight. Your microphone stopped working. <laughs> Sorry, thanks for the information. What uh, we got, we got Mike there, back there. 
Can you hear me now? Is this better? Yes. Yes. Okay, because I can't hear myself. <laughs> um, so I think uh, things have. Now it's gone again. Any better here? Yes. yes. For for the moment. <laughs> uh, still. Okay. Okay. Um, I was saying that I think everything has fallen into place pretty well for tonight's for tonight's talk. Um, few few outliers that we can we can do with uh, you know do without for now. But um, Terrafil for me, um, my interest goes back about since the time that I started doing research. Um, I used to work for First National Stores. Uh, does anybody remember First National in, in Simsbury? Store 177, um, where Andy's is now, or was. Um, Bob Nelson was the store manager. I don't know if that name rings a bell with anybody, but I, I actually I finagled myself into uh, writing an a, um, employee newspaper for all the stores in Connecticut and a few outliers in New York and Massachusetts and used to ride around in a company car um, at age 19 um, to gather news from all the stores in Connecticut. Of course, along the way, I was looking for railroad stuff. So um, the two, the kind of the two went hand in hand. Um, that was my first encounter with uh, Terraville coming up here uh, in probably 1970. The second encounter is when I dragged my sister, who was uh, eight years younger, um, out for a little expedition to Terraville in the middle of the winter. <laughs> there was snow on the ground, like about two feet deep, three feet deep, and we approached, I can still picture going up Main Street, um, as peculiar as that angle and rise is, um, and then going down to the end of Main Street, and Main Street extended, which I don't know of any other town in the world calls their extension of Main Street, Main Street Extended. But, um, and seeing the piers for the Springfield branch in the river, which they will be there forever, of course. And um, driving down to the end of the street and then parking and starting to walk toward the Farmington River. There was two, feet of, two three feet of snow on the ground, and I don't know what we expected to see because the ground was covered with snow, so you can't see any outlines of anything at that point. Um, the snow was crusted on the top so that when you're walking on it, you're, you fell in every other foot step or whatever, so like up to your knee. So that didn't last very long. So we head back to, uh, to Hartford in the car, you know, and got warmed up and hot cocoa and stuff. But, um, and then later to find out that the, um, the historical events that happened with the wreck of 1878 and with the Battle of Springfield, which we'll talk about, Battle for Springfield, um, in the uh, early 1900s, really makes uh, Terraville a pretty unique place in railroad history in, um, in this state, of course, and possibly in others as well. But um, so without further ado, um, you all have your timelines. I this time remembered to put it in the presentation, so it will be there also when this is recorded. Um, I apologize for the smallness of the type, but this you know Microsoft Word looked fine on screen, and when it I type when I printed it out, it gave me this tiny little type that you almost need a magnifying glass for. Um, hopefully you don't, but but increasingly most of us are. Uh, so we'll get on to with the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so we know all this already. Uh, there's the, uh, the timeline. Of course, it magnifies nicely here. Um, uh, a bold-faced, uh, whatever, uh, plug for the Milldale Depot project, which I'll get out of the way first. Um, this is the depot down there in Southington. Um, built in 1892 and still in pretty good shape. Um, Doris Day stopped by 
1968, I'm sorry, 1958, for the film, part, part of the filming of the movie, It Happened to Jane. Um, so we have her stuff plastered all over the walls. Um, and on the 60th anniversary of her being there, on the exact day, last year, 2018, we had the town proclaim it Doris Day, not Doris Day, Doris Day, and um, and we had a cake and we had a you know a, I gave a presentation on the filming of the movie and the history of the depot and we had um, a good crowd and we came back to visit the depot um, afterward. Um, there's the Doris Corner with the poster from the movie and some uh, memorabilia of her visit. We are in the process, um, as was mentioned in the uh, introduction, of restoring the signal mast and putting the semaphore blades back up top. And those levers um, that my hand is on one of, those levers, when reattached, will actually operate the train order signal. So the semaphore blade will go up and down when you flip the rod, uh, the lever, either way. So we have a small, dedicated group of volunteers. That means two, um, <laughs> to maybe two and a half if you count Bruce. Um, but um, you know, and we're working, uh, whatever, at, at a reasonable pace. We took the pole down. You can see the rusty pole here, um, standing. We took it down. We had to re-weld parts of it. Um, we had to obviously uh, clean the rust off and, and prime and paint and scrape and whatever. And the pole is back up, so that's, that's an accomplishment. But uh, there's much more work to do. So um, the address is 447 Canal Street. I should have put that someplace. But um, if you Google Milldale Depot, you, uh, you can get a map on Google and, um, and come down and visit. So. So let's get back to the subject at hand, which is Terrafil. Terrafil was served by two railroads, um, as you probably know, the New Haven and Northampton, which was popularly known as the Canal Line. Um, here's a bond certificate here um, from them. Registered refunding, refunding consolidated mortgage, 4% 50-year gold bond secured by refunding consolidated mortgage of the New Haven and Northampton Company. If anybody, if anybody here is an economist who can tell me what that means, um, aside from the fact that you give up $5,000, um, I, I would be interested in knowing. But this was, this was issued in later days when the canal line was under the jurisdiction or ownership of the um, New York, New Haven, and Hartford, which was the Connecticut's really only railroad, sole, uh, almost complete control of railroads in um, southern New England, Rhode Island, and um, <clears throat> eastern Massachusetts as well. So, you know, times, money was flowing, you know, whatever. They were taking in big money, they were lending big money, they were borrowing big, big money. Um, the smaller of the, the two railroads, of course, was the originally Connecticut Western, um, and reorganized in 1880, that's 1871, um, and reorganized as the Hartford and Connecticut Western um, in 1881. And there was a couple of subsequent corporate transformations, which are, uh, I have on the timeline, but we, we uh, really won't go through here. Ultimate, ultimate controlling company was the Central New England Railway um, of 1898 to 99. The area that we're going to be talking about is here, um, and I've tried to um, put it all here on one map. Um, and I color-coded, this is my Google Earth map, which purports or intends or hopes to capture all of this information for the state. It's uh, obviously a work in progress, like everything. But um, the 1850 trackage, the canal line going up and down uh, through Simsbury to Granby, and down to New Haven is in green, as is their branch to Terraville. Um, and we will look more closely at that in a minute. Uh, the red is the Connecticut Western, 1871, which kind of did this loop up to Terraville 
and back down to Simsbury and then over to Winstead and um, over to the New York State Line. The yellow trackage up here is the Springfield extension of technically 19, uh, you know, technically 1900. Um, train started running, there were some problems with this. So the track was in, but the trains weren't running, so let, let's give it a 1900 to, uh, to round it off. The um, transportation in the Pioneer Valley, as this upper part of uh, the valley here is called, you know, really owes a lot to the canal, uh, the canal that preceded the canal line. Um, and transported a really kind of an amazing amount of merchandise and an amazing variety, um, which we can see some of here. Um, mostly household goods, I guess. Um, the, canal, the canal is only four feet deep, so I'm not sure how heavy a load those boats could carry. I'm sure there were ways of maximizing that, but this particular um, store down in Avon was getting this kind of merchandise from the from the canals. Um, and that was the case, you know, Plainville wouldn't be what it is today, Southington, um, Avon, uh, without, you know, without the transportation that the uh, canal furnished. So that was, uh, that was the precursor, obviously, of the canal railroad, which, you know, the guys got together and said, it's an awful lot of trouble to run a canal. You know, you gotta worry about the water, there's too much, there's too little. Um, you know, farmers punch holes in our uh, berms periodically because they don't like us crossing their land. So why not just put a couple of rails in the ground and get a locomotive? And that's what they did. Um, Terraville actually got its big break when the cornerstone of the Terraville Tariff Woolen Factory was laid. Uh, and if I can bring this a little forward, I may be able to see the dates better. Um, this is 1825, uh, April 25th, 1825. It's actually on the 14th of April, 1825, that the cornerstone was laid. Building of stone, 85 by 46, four stories high, and was expected to turn out 100 yards per day. I don't know how much that is in actual volume. Um, or if that's a very impressive amount, I'm sure it increased later. Um, one of the problems with, one of the interesting things about Terraville is a lot of people don't know where it is. Uh, and it, it, frankly, you know, when I, I really, some time ago when I tried to come up here, I got so confused with the 185 and the 189, I think I went home and said, and maybe some other time. Uh, but. Uh, in this case, the postmaster, I think it's in Providence, Rhode Island, was returning something to Terraville because he didn't know where it was. Uh, so returned a paper directed to the post office in Terraville saying he does not know where the village is. So, and the, the article goes uh, into, you know, saying, well, we got a big carpet manufacturing here and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, 11 miles north, northwest of uh, Hartford on the Farmington River. We have a post office and like, what's your problem? <laughs> but um, anyhow, I, I think, you know, uh, where, where Terraville is in kind of an isolated little corner, I think um, it kind of adds to its charm in a way, but uh, I, I go for these kind of out of the way places. Anyhow, carpet manufacturing um, the amount of, uh, in 10 short years, this is 18, seven years, $123,000 worth of capital. Um, their manufacture, they have, note this figure of employees, 367 workers, um, 95 of which are male weavers, um, putting out 140,000 yards of Ingram or Kidderminster carpet annually. Um, and again, I don't know how that compares with outputs at other mills, but it looks like a, a lot of cloth to me. Um, and at the same time, uh, importing or utilizing 237,000 pounds of uh, wool and yarn. Besides, period of time is to the, besides, um, I'm not sure how to read that already. Um, labor exceeds 30,000. There's an interesting note here about the canal. Um, maybe it's an, an upcoming article. 
But uh, John Warner Barber in his um, Connecticut Historical Collections visited every town in the state and put these beautiful woodcuts in his book. And here is the south view of Tariffville, actually northward view, um, in Simsbury, uh, Tariffville in Simsbury. There's the big mill building. Well, there was a new technology afoot. Um, from the perspective of the 1830s, and that was the railroad. Um, the earliest railroads were very primitive affairs, as this uh, illustration indicates. Um, basically, the engine was a boiler with a, with a smokestack. Um, your tender, uh, you know, for uh, fueling the locomotive was a flat car with a couple of barrels of wood um, and stagecoaches stagecoach bodies on, of course, flanged wheels with the inside rim that keep the wheels on the track. So that was the, that was the kind of uh, locomotive or train uh, from earliest times. And we're talking the 1820s, 1830s. By the time the railroad came to um, even uh, Simsbury on the canal line, you know, where they were doing 440s, which are uh, four pilot wheels, four driving wheels, and no trailing wheels. We'll see an example of that coming up. But um, so the Canal Railroad is completed as far as Tariffville, a few miles above Simsbury, um, and nearly to Peddler's Lot. And nobody seems to know where that is. And I've asked the best minds in the room, who are Mary Jane Springman and, um, and John Nagy, and I'm sure there are others, but nobody, uh, nobody seems to know where Peddler's Lot is, somewhere north of downtown Simsbury. Um, and the friends of the road are to make an excursion over it tomorrow from New Haven. And if this is the excursion, uh, the young lawyers of New Haven in taking a ride on the canal road became so exhilarated that at Tariffville they got off and slid downhill with the boys. <laughs> Let them slide. Poor fellows, they have uphill work enough to do at home. Um, and there's an early timetable, um, probably from 1850. Terraville had the distinction of actually being the terminus for the canal line. It wasn't Granby to start, uh, or, or ever. Um, the track did stop at Granby and stop construction at Granby in 1850, much like it did in Terraville. Um, and in Collinsville as well, 1850 is the completion date for all three locations. But when you look at the uh, schedules for the canal line for the next 20 years, the terminus is Terraville. So the 1855 Woodford um, Atlas map of Hartford County, which is a beautiful piece of work, shows the trackage here um, and the spur into Tariffville Depot at the end of the line, north side of the track, and a triangular intersection of track, uh, which is called a Y, W-Y-E in railroad terminology. Um, I've tried to replicate that as best as we can figure out on the Google Earth map, um, and it looks like about this, this being Woolcott Road, and this being Wilkett Road and this little green building. And if you look over here where the red arrow is, you can see a curved, kind of a curved line in the wood or in the edge of the forest or tree line um, swinging this way toward the green building. And if you go up a little farther north, you can't see it as well, but I think it's this, which is, there's the brook there. And then there's this unbroken, or more, more, more or less unbroken, line of trees. And there's the canal line uh, trail. And the, so you're kind of looking like this, as far as your triangle goes. Um, we did a little exploration, um, in some ways related, in some ways not, to, the, to this presentation. And we went up as far as Money Sunk Brook. Um, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. And there's this beautiful, I mean, I was, I was like, my jaw dropped to see this beautiful 1850 culvert still in use 
probably could still take trains as well because they were built they were built for the ages. Um, that's right up here where Munis, uh, Money Sunk Brook um, comes out of Lake Basile and comes down and goes toward Wolcott Road. So if you're up that way and um, it, it's a little bit of a slither down the embankment because it is kind of steep there, but there, there's ways that it's uh, more gradual and you can get down uh, and see that culvert, which I think is worth looking at. That is uh, Carl Walter, the eminent canal historian with us on Sunday and my friend Bill Vorvart, who is one of the depot uh, volunteers down in Milldale. So what is a Y? Um, it is a triangular intersection of track and basically it allows trains from any of the three directions to reverse course and go back where they came from. So instead of a turntable, which is a flat iron um, plate which locomotives would enter onto and then be turned, twirled as it were in the direction they wanted to go, uh, this was a inexpensive way of turning a train around. So, um, and in the shape of, uh, shape of the letter Y, it was called a Y. <clears throat> in my um, more footloose days, I was out in Arizona and came across a town called Y, uh, and I asked why, <laughs> and it turns out that this actually was connected at one time, forming a Y, and since the town couldn't name itself the letter Y, it chose W-H-Y. Uh, and that gets us, in some ways, to these two guys, if I can make this work this time. This will be amazing. This will be a first. Now, on the St. Louis, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellows on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Do you know the fellows' names? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean, the fellow's name on first base. Who? The fellow playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first. I don't know. Third, third base. Woo! <laughs> you got an outfield? Oh, sure. St. Louis has got a oh, good outfield? Absolutely. The left fielder's name. Why? Okay, so that's, that's the why that I wanted to get in. Hopefully I, can, hopefully I can get back to where I'm supposed to be. Okay. Um, so. And of course, where there's a why, there has to be a why not. That was, that was in North Carolina. That was a later trip. Um, OK, so timetable, back to business here. Um, timetable and rate card for uh, the canal line um, running again from New Haven to Terraville. There's your destination or your, your terminal point. Um, a buck and a quarter for the entire distance. If you wanted to go from Simsbury down to Plainville, uh, for example, to catch the train to Hartford, because that was the only way to get to Hartford by train at that time, um, would be 35 cents. I think 85 plus, or 15 here, 85 from $1.20, I think is 35. So. Um, so that's at 2.05 a.m. is arrival in Jericho? 2.05 a.m.? No, 2.05. Yeah. I think I think it slides. It's what it's a.m. up here, oh. and then two 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 o five. Yeah, you know, sometimes these tables can be uh, uh, difficult to interpret. Um, all right, so we're back to the uh, back to the Y, and the branch coming across over to Terraville. The only uh, vestige that I know of, I think John said that there was a berm visible somewhere is the crossing of the Farmington River on the original railroad bridge into, into Terraville. And it's these um, the piles of dirt and rock, apparently, at this point, uh, they've been reduced to over the years, um, which, on which stood the pilings for the bridge into Terraville, the first bridge. So that's still there, and it's not too uh, difficult to access 
through the uh, the condo property, which I forget the name of at the moment. Um, but so come in, coming into Terraville, we have an arrangement like this. This is from the New Haven Museum index book of the Canal Railroad um, depot was basically at the end, like we saw in the previous uh, map, at the end of Main Street, not Main Street extended, but Main Street by the river, end of Main Street. So that's the passenger station, that's the freight house, and that's an engine house. They apparently stored the engine here overnight and then took it out of the house in the morning to go back. Um, and again, using the Y at, at Hoskins um, to turn the train. In other words, when it came up here, it was facing forward, and then when it left, it backed out and backed up the Y and then headed south for, uh, for New Haven. Uh, again, uh, this, the um, 1869 Baker and Tilder, Tilden map uh, showing railroad station at the end of uh, Main Street. That's, that is possibly, this is the station in Simsbury that used to be a, um, architect's office. Um, it's down there on Iron Horse Boulevard, um, beautifully kept uh, and hopefully still is. Uh, this picture was taken a couple of years ago. But um, this possibly was what the station in Terraville looked like. Uh, the footprint actually is, seems to match. Um, so we're, that's a bit speculative, but if, if it were there, uh, this is five Main Street extended. This is where it would be and where it would look like today. My friend Al Weaver has uh, this knack or talent for superimposing pictures one on the other. I don't know how to do this yet. Um, but so he plopped this station down in front of the house that's really there um, at five extended. So we also have fortunate, and I don't know where I found this, but we have a payroll sheet for the uh, Terrafield branch. Um, we have an agent here, um, and I'm not sure that I have deciphered any of these names. E.B. Phelps, no, that could be Phelps, E.G. I don't know what, what that is. Um, Earl Gorman, mm -hmm. helper. Um, Albert Conway, engineer, engineer, brakeman, brakeman. Uh, I don't know that we can fiddle too much with the names. So hash marks for each of the days they worked. It uh, looks like the pay for uh, the, the lesser individuals was $27, so like a dollar a day. Uh, engineers and agents got more. And this is um, October 1851. So we are fortunate to have another very detailed map, uh, 1850. Uh, Chauncey Barnard, whoever he was, we're not really sure, maybe worked in the insurance industry um, and maybe the map was drawn for insurance purposes. But this also shows the, uh, the facilities here on the, at the end of the canal line uh, branch, the engine house, the freight house, and the passenger station. The a map is really encompasses most of the downtown area and, 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 uh, and beyond. So it shows the track coming down here um, behind uh, Main Street, behind all the stores that are up on Main Street um, at a very low level. It's down by the river um, and ending just uh, beyond Tunxus Avenue, if this is uh, Tunxus Avenue here, I think. And there's the big mill building. Uh, note the Presbyterian church here that will be coming up for discussion shortly. Uh, that's the area down below by the river, um, down where the canal, uh, the canal line branch, the mill, sat. Um, John Nagy pointed out yesterday uh, that this is part of the structure for the canal. So this would be like the western wall of the canal, which was here, and the railroad would be up here, heading toward the mill. And of course, there was the big fire of June 10th, 1867, really devastated the town uh, and really um, you know, shot employment to uh, way down, if not destroyed it completely. Um, 
various newspaper articles, 11 factories and a dozen dwellings were destroyed at Terraville. On the 10th, losses estimated at a million and a half, and 2,000 persons are thrown out of employment. This is, this is a figure that I question, um, and we talked about it a little before uh, everybody else arrived with a member of the audience. Um, the entire population of Simsbury, the town of Simsbury, was 2,000 in 1870. So I don't think everybody worked here. Um, and even if people came over from Granby and, you know, and surrounding areas, um, I, we saw a 367 figure before, and I saw another uh, uh, figure of 600 somewhere else. So I'm not sure how you would drill down the number of actual people thrown out of work, but I don't really think it could be 2,000. In spite of the disaster, the Westfield, or maybe in, in, you know, in caused by it as a result, uh, we have this fascination sometimes for seeing the results of devastation. So the Westfield Methodist Society Sunday School and its friends brought a picnic down here um, two months after the fire uh, and probably gawked at all the ruins and you know as part of the part of the festivities but on a more sobering note terroristville a year later is fast becoming deserted there's no minister there's only one doctor and about 400 people living here so not not too bright an outlook at that point uh, the next New Haven in Northampton schedule that I have does not have Terraville on it, and that's uh, December of 1869, so that's after the fire. It's also after the New Haven in Northampton, the canal line, <clears throat> regained its independence from the New York and New Haven Railroad, which had leased it from the beginning to kind of keep it uncompetitive. Um, so now the canal line was on its own, and chose at this point apparently to abandon the Terraville branch completely because there was no money here. There was no business, no uh, freight to transport anymore. The, <clears throat> there was a survey done, you know, a, such a wide ranging survey like it had never been done in history um, for the federal government aimed in 1914, 15, 16 at evaluating the worth of all the railroads in the country and valuation maps were drawn and pictures taken of rolling stock and uh, depots and, and all kinds of uh, railroad assets. It's not very often, and I don't really think I've ever seen a note on any other Val map, that the operation of the Terraville branch was discontinued in 1869, which we have other evidence of, and the tracks taken up in 1870. So this is um, another validation of the fact that there was no Terraville branch in use after 1869. Um, Bob Adams in the Battle for Springfield article, which I have here, um, says that the tracks weren't taken up. The line was abandoned, but the tracks were left in the ground. Um, I'm not sure how he makes that claim. I would tend to go with the, uh, the official record here uh, instead. But. Uh, we do know that the right-of-way on the uh, branch was intact enough for Virgil Griffith to walk across the trestle of the old branch of the New Haven and Northampton and fell in, injuring himself quite seriously. He crawled home near next morning, near morning, and a neighbor went in search of his hat, which he found together with his cane, two dollars in silver, and a bottle labeled rum <laughs> with, a, with a capital R. Uh, the last name article tells the story. So, so the right of way was still intact as, as of that point. Um, so now we get to the point where the next railroad wants to come in. And the only way to come in is basically through uh, uh, Marco's restaurant and the Cracker Barrel. Um, because that's really the only place at a level that they wanted to build at. They didn't want to build down by the river. Um, so they had to come up really along Main Street. And standing right in the way, of course, was that Presbyterian church, which uh, the Episcopalians had bought, I guess, in 1856, paying $1,500 for the brick building, 
capacity of 300 people, which is pretty substantial, and 200 for the land. In 1870, the railroad, after it obtained judgment of condemnation, bought the church property for 11.5, a, a hefty, um, hefty little profit, um, and moved elsewhere. So um, there's the Presbyterian church, and there's where the track had to go. And there was really no argument because there was no place else to put the track. So between Marcos and uh, Cracker Barrel, right in this vicinity, or you know thereabouts, a few feet either way, was where the church was and where the track was. Um, the interesting thing about the church, and this has been yet to be proven, is that the mill actually built a, um, a house of worship, which the three denominations were to share, which is actually kind of, it's so, um, it's so charitable, it, it kind of defies imagination, uh, <laughs> that they would be interested that much in religion to begin with. There were different times, but actually that three, congr three different um, Protestant sects would actually use the same building. Um, and that being um, the Baptist, the Congregationalists, and the, um, what's the other one? The, the which? Presbyterian. The Presbyterian, right. Uh, because the um, Episcopalians were down at St. Andrews, I believe, in um, North, North Bloomfield. So they didn't get in until later. Um, uh, didn't I replace, well, I thought I replaced this with, um, with a better image, but we do have documents uh, outlining the appointment of uh, appraisers because it had to go through, the condemnation thing had to go through a board of appraisers. Um, I don't, unfortunately, that image did not carry through with this copy. Um, but the newspapers made mention, several newspapers made mention of the fact that at Terraville, the road runs directly through the center of a large brick church, that being the only possible place for it to get through the village at anything like a feasible route, and then goes through the, um, the business about the fire and the uh, poor economic situation. This one is kind of a travelogue and says, um, the Connecticut Western Track lies through some remarkable locations. At Terraville, we rushed very irreverently through a church whose dismantled walls in part were still standing. So apparently they took down the north wall and the south wall and left the east wall and the west wall standing, and maybe the roof. This article, which is uh, kind of garbled in the, um, in the uh, whatever, in the, in the flesh here, um, says, in Terraville, the railway makes a huge hole directly through the Episcopal Church, a large brick building that still stands over the track, over the track, and unless removed, will soon afford an inside view to thousands who do not know what the inside of a church looks like. So, a little commentary on religious values. Uh, and yet again, the road will cause a division of the Baptist church. Since it was shared by the three uh, sects, um, apparently, or denominations, apparently there was some confusion as to what it was at that time in some of the papers. It's called the Baptist church. Um, the line passing directly through the building, which will be used as a depot, which is kind of astounding because I don't think I had ever seen I, there, a depot was never built there, but the idea that there was going to be one actually was pretty popular in town, but it just never happened. But uh, the idea that in 1871, when the railroad was coming in, um, that was already remarked about uh, was, uh, is kind of surprising. What did happen, and we will soon learn, is that the Connecticut Western used the old canal line depot at the end of Main Street for 20 years uh, until it burned in 1892, which we'll see. Um, all right, so the railroad's back in town and the prosperity is just around the corner. 
Um, the Connecticut Screw Company, incorporated by the present legislature, has purchased the carpet company uh, property and uh, will be turning the wheels and making lively times at tariff um, in short order. Uh, opening day schedule, um, the railroad opened on December 21st, or, or actually I thought it was the 22nd. but. Um, and then we come to this article, which I couldn't resist. Um, Adams New Grove and Picnic Grounds. Nobody knew where this was either until John and I talked about it yesterday. Um, newly fitted up with large, spacious platform tables, swings, boats on the river, um, on the banks of the Farmington River near the depot of the Connecticut Western, which of course is at the <coughs> foot of Main Street. Remember Abel Adams? who sold the property to the canal line for the depot. Well, apparently he owned this piece of property also because he's advertising his grove, which probably is your Terraville Park um, in later incarnation. And maybe that's where it got its start. Um, and of course, the depot would be here at the end of Main Street. Um, there was an interesting event um, celebrating the Emancipation Proclamation here in 1873. Um, 700 people came to talk about the plight of the black man, the black uh, race in the country, and um, several speakers, excursion trains, uh, you know, coming from Hartford. And um, aside from the beauty of the Grove, which may have been Adams Grove, um, we wonder if somehow the, the, the atmosphere here invites, I wouldn't say dissent, but free discussion of, um, you know, of political events and developments and social um, developments as well. So it's kind of a landmark event. Um, I th I'm sure there were others around the state, but this group from Hartford chose Terraville. Um, political ramifications of railroads. You, you um, wash my hand, I'll, I'll wash yours, or scratch my back, or whatever. People wanted the extension to Springfield even as the Connecticut Western was being built. Um, in fact, there was fear on the part of the other railroads that that's what the intention of the branch was, to go to Springfield. And that's why they got all like anti-competitive and tried to stifle the, uh, the canal line. But in fact, as this indicates, Northwestern Connecticut, is, it is whispered, may set the Tariffville branch against the one capital question. And it will be gondola for gondola, as they used to say in Venice. So like, you know, you give me something, I give you something. Um, and the, of course, the two capital, the one capital question was the fact that at that time, Connecticut had two capitals rotating between New Haven and Hartford. Um, and in 1875, that was a settled matter, and Hartford got the nod, and, and New Haven didn't, apparently. But this is an allusion to, you know, if you don't give me what I want up in northwestern Connecticut, I may vote. And then there was complaining about Hartford, because Hartford was against the Springfield extension for fear of losing business to, uh, to Springfield, you know, which may or may not have been true, but that was, the, that was their feeling. Uh, 1878, we're just going to, you know, fly over the, uh, the, the bridge collapse. Um, you probably know that story better than, than I can tell it. But, um, you know, a tragedy, uh, but that has been, I think, pretty well written about. Um, and, you know, just was a black eye for the uh, Connecticut Western for, for some time. But bridge was rebuilt and business went on. Uh, the vestige of the, um, the eastern abutment for the bridge is still there behind the condos. I'm still not sure what those condos are named. Governor's Bridge. Governor's Bridge condos? Yeah. Um, right adjacent to the schoolyard and down around? OK. Uh, thank you. Um, and that's Bill Vorvart standing, you know, looking, looking out toward the, uh, toward the west like uh, Lewis and Clark. Um, <laughs> And this is the view across the water. The ideal view would be from a canoe. And I don't know if anybody here has ever ventured to do that. But um, I may have to do that at some point 
so you could look back at the abutment and get a real picture of it. Um, again, the idea appears in print, at least, to build a station and freight depot directly opposite the post office at Terraville. Where was the post office? In the Cracker Barrel uh, building uh, at the time. So we're still talking about that same location. It's kind of like, it's like haunted, um, or it's haunting the people of Terraville. So the women of Terraville decide at some point in 1892, April of 1892, that that old station, which is now uh, 1892, it's 40 years old, um, needs some work. It needs to be renovated, painted, papered, for to, to eliminate the eyesore to what strangers visit the village. And they're sick and tired of waiting for the railroad to do something about it. <laughs> so they're going to do it themselves. Before they could get their paint pots organized, or actually they were in the station, it burned. Oh, no. On May 4th, um, uh, May 4th, let's see, May 4th, May 5th, article May 5th, the day before, last night, so um, the, probably the night of the 4th, or maybe the morning of the 5th, but uh, anyhow, the, uh, the tramps inside, at, caught inside at the time, gave their names as John Doe, Richard Rowe, and John Francis. It turns out that the real names were Frank Daly, Frank Leonard and John Sullivan. They couldn't be charged with setting the fire because there was no proof, but they were charged with trespassing and paid small fines. Um, <clears throat> and here again is another call for, for God's sakes, why don't you build a new depot downtown by the post office where there's plenty of room and it's the best site in the village for this purpose. Never happened. But we have some commentary on the building that burned. Uh, it belonged to the Consolidated Road, which had again uh, leased the canal line in 1887. And it was erected when that company's branch track extended across the meadow. The C N E and W, another incarnation, um, road have used it for 20 years. So we, here we have 1892 going back to uh, 1871, essentially. So that's what the Connecticut Western used as their depot, the old canal line depot, for 20 years. Um, but now we'll build a new depot on the opposite side of the track, nearer the center of the village. We'll see about that. The loss was hardly, uh, will hardly exceed $200. Now this is one of my favorite all-time quotes about the condition of railroad stations. The Terraville Railroad Station burned the other night it was the meanest, shabbiest, dirtiest, and most disgraceful hog pen on the road between Hartford and Poughkeepsie, through courtesy known as an alleged railroad station. <laughs> Excepting, of course, that ancient old ark on the flat in Winstead. This is the Winstead Herald. It has to be. Uh, but this was a clipping I grabbed from some uh, printed page, um, and there was a railroad station there, obviously, that they reviled as well. Um, that, that's, that's, that's classic. When I, do, when I do the talk on the good, the bad, and the ugly railroad stations in Connecticut, that will be uh, one, of the, one of the leads. Um, so later in 1892, um, new railroad station is being built across the track from the side of the old structure that burned. Um, it will be small, but a decided improvement over that old building. Uh, new railroad station almost complete later in 1892, enough so that the station master can do his work there. Where was the second station? More or less opposite where the first one was, like the newspaper said. So that's the 1893 Heard Atlas of Connecticut. Um, of course, the desired location was down here, but this may be a few feet closer to the center of town, but not much. Uh, so basically it was still up where everybody didn't want it to be. If that station were built, it might have looked like this. This is pure speculation. This is um, South Middleborough, Massachusetts. I just pulled this out of my hat this morning and Al Weaver imposed, superimposed it on 
what's that address up there? Um, five Main Street Extended. So it's the first house on the left as you go around the bend. Um, that's possibly what the station looked like. Small, serviceable, um, but nothing, nothing elaborate. Uh, there's a couple of views, again, coming around the bend. Uh, Main Street, bridge, former bridge to East Granby. Um, track coming around the bend toward, um, toward the condos at the end of uh, Main Street Extended. Um, and then, oh dear, we don't want that. Um, uh, and then another, another view of basically the same, uh, the same scene. Carl Stieg was an avid collector of uh, CNE stuff. He passed away a couple of years ago before writing the book on the extension, the Springfield extension that he had uh, planned to write. The telephone came to um, the railroad station in 1895 um, for a small fee. And by the next year, Ariel Mitchelson had one, Charles Holcomb, Sheldon Munson, Harvey Tucker, Dr. Worcester, um, Frank Wilk Wilkinson Manufacturing, which I believe took up residence in the mill building um, as a later incarnation. So the phone coming in to town. All right, so now the Springfield extension has been on everybody's mind since 1871. And now the Central New England or the Hartford and Connecticut Western is trying to make it a reality. So they petition the railroad commissioners to give them permission to cross the canal line at the end of uh, Main Street. Because you can see from the map that in order to in order to get to Springfield, you have to cross this abandoned, possibly trackless right of way to get your connections in. So in other words, the red line is this, the Connecticut Western. They need to build this leg of a Y. Here's another Y for you. Um, and this leg here to connect their track to go to Springfield. And that has to cross the green line. And that's the uh, New York, New Haven, and Hartford's kind of ace in the hole. You can't cross our track without permission. Um, so the Battle of Springfield commences. Um, and of course, the railroad president, the um, CNE president, ultimately, says, "What do we? What do we care about an injunction? What you know? What, what big deal is that?" Well, apparently, it was still a big enough deal where they built the Y, possibly in the dead of night. Um, there, there was a lot of this going on. Something would be built overnight, and then when the sheriff showed up in the morning, it had to be ripped up. This happened in East Granby as well. Um, the, uh, obviously, the New Haven Railroad was m very much against the extension and pulled out all the stops to, uh, to try to uh, forestall it happening. The attitude of that railroad, as expressed by its counsel, Lynn Harrison, was that it was taking the land of another corporation that the consolidated owned from the center of the earth to the constellations above its land. And nobody could trespass. Uh, you know, even up in the sky, air rights, mineral rights, nothing. Um, so the Battle of Springfield, which we've alluded to, I have this article here if anybody wants to make a copy. It's not footnoted, but it's very authoritative. I, I think Bob Adams did his homework. Um, the situation here, he goes all the way up to um, East Granby. There's the Montague Farm. That was the next ploy, the second battle, um, where the New York, New Haven, Hartford surreptitiously bought the farm so the CNE couldn't put the track on it. <laughs> and this resulted in a $100,000 detour so that the extension could be built to Springfield. Shortly thereafter, the farm was for sale for $150. Uh, so this, this is the kind of shenanigan that the New Haven was not above playing. But um, so a couple of pictures to describe the situation at, um, at East Granby. There's the locomotive on, stalled on one end of the 313 feet. There's a hand car on the other, and there's a shoe fly 
probably built in the dead of night and removed shortly thereafter to get materials from one side to the other. So, and I, a, a train, I think I've read that actually a, a locomotive somehow managed to get between the two points. So the train actually did run. Uh, here's the legislature going up to study the situation because this was a big deal. This was in the newspapers for like three years. There was an article every day about the progress or the, you know, the, the uh, shenanigans going on. Um, this is probably the most expressive. There's um, a construction worker or, I don't know, some kind of official or just a laborer with a white glove or handkerchief, like waving down the locomotive, like you can't, you can't come through the barbed wire fence. Uh, so th if anything symbolic of the, uh, the uh, Battle of Montague Farm, that photograph probably is it. Um, the Y connecting the branch, they, the railroad commissioners did give permission to the central New England to construct the Y at Terraville because there was no good reason not to. And to force them to put in a bridge to go over the canal line right of way would have been, you know, just astronomically expensive and totally out of the question. So they did get permission to, um, to uh, put the Y where we'll see it is or was. Um, and trains started to run to uh, East Granby, at least, um, on um, 12, December 17th, 1901. And there's the bridge, um, the, to, uh, the railroad bridge to uh, East Granby, which uh, the piers of which are still standing today, are beautiful sights. Um, Mary Jane Springman um, did all of us a great service by taking note cards from the Windsor Locks Journal on all of these events. And this one deals with the Montague Farm. Um, I guess this is 220, 1903, when the, the controversy was still in uh, being talked about. Uh, building a new passenger station at Terraville between the tracks of the main line and those of the Stringfield branch. This is in 1903. So there's Main Street extended. Um, there's the condo building down at the end and another of Al Weaver's superimpositions. There's the station standing in front of the condo building. Um, uh, main line going to Hartford, um, passing track here, and this is the Y track to go to the bridge. Uh, and a very sharp curve it is with the guardrail that you can see. So a couple of pictures of the depot. And John and I were there yesterday and we wondered if this factory, former factory building that became a boarding house for tobacco workers is actually not the condo building or in fact might be the condo building that stands there today. The foundation on this end is, um, has an amazingly historic look to it. It's like red, red sandstone with um, heavy, heavy mortaring, which does not look like the other end, which is cinder block. So we may have be dealing with, uh, be dealing with um, a building that's been added onto basically, but dates back uh, you know, maybe to the early 1900s. Um, station agent and train conductor probably. Notice the diagonally shaped, or, or should I say the agent's bay on the corner end of the station rather than in the middle of the station where it usually appears. In this case, the agent had to look basically in three directions. Trains coming from Hartford, trains coming, uh, trains coming from Simsbury, trains coming from Hartford this way, and trains coming from Springfield that way. So cleverly, they put the agent's bay on the corner so he could look in three directions at once or whatever. Uh, successively. Um, train headed for um, Simsbury, uh, passenger station, freight station, 440 engine, which was the American type, which dominated the, uh, the early 1800s and really uh, lasted quite a while into the 1900s. Um, <clears throat> the valuation map um, shows the trackage, of course, it shows the frame passenger station, frame being wooded. Um, the 
uh, Agents Bay on the corner here, diagonally, as we just talked about. The frame passenger station, the factory building, a cattle ramp. Uh, every every uh, station in a rural area, uh, maybe maybe not had a cattle ramp, but uh, many did. Uh, coal pocket, car house. So there were several structures here, on you know, as part of the railroad facilities. This uh, copy of the valuation map has an interesting parcel of land here with a track running through it. Any any guesses as to what that is? Uh, the old the old church, the old uh, Episcopal <laughs> church. Um, a couple of views of Terraville Station, 1929, 1930s, 1933. That may be Bill Moneypenny looking. He was a avid photographer, um, and you can see the tight curve of the of the Y track going toward the bridge. That access road to Terraville Park does not look like it has been altered in any way, shape, or form. So that actually was the right of way to get to the bridge. So you put that together with the trackage that you see in front of it, put the station a little bit farther back, um, but still in front of the condo building, um, and you have you know the layout as it existed then. The 1934 aerial shows the passenger station the freight house, this building in between, I don't know what this is, additional warehouse space, maybe for tobacco, um, and then the factory building. The bridge to East Granby obviously was still there. Um, station boarded up, probably circa 1938 when service ended. Um, by 1903, 1902, the first train actually used the loop to get through to Springfield. Um, this is all on, on your timeline, so you don't have to try to remember any of it. Um, track across Montague Farm is finally completed. Parcel was finally for sale for a buck fifty, um, and the CNE bought it and put the original right of way in place and b basically abandoned the loop after a hundred thousand dollar expenditure. Um, so this is the Central New England as it's at its fullest extent. Branch from Terraville up to Springfield, branch down to New Haven or mainline to New Haven. The rest of the railroads in this map were all New York, New Haven, and Hartford. So you can see it's kind of the David, maybe not quite a David and Goliath thing, but the, the, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford had money. The CNE did not. Um, and basically, all the New York, New Haven, and Hartford wanted of the CNE was the bridge. The Poughkeepsie Bridge, which still stands today as the walkway across the Hudson. Um, going down a little farther south, we need to go to the one other station in Terraville, um, which was, and that was in front of the mill building. This was trestle actually from Marcos um, all the way over to past Elm Street. Um, and elevated on fill um, thereafter to a point, I don't know, halfway down to, um, halfway down to Bloomfield um, until it, want, it went off to the, uh, to the east on, uh, on Mountainside. Uh, there's a little more of the trestle. The attraction for the, and the reason for the other station was Bartlett's Tower which there was a succession of towers on uh, Talcott Mountain, or Laurel Hill. Um, and this was a big attraction with uh, you know, the magnificent view. Um, and um, Mr. Bartlett, who was quite the entrepreneur, built this little station for people to detrain there, and it was a flag stop. So in other words, you could signal, tell the conductor you wanted to get off, or signal you know, by jumping up and down, or uh, many of the flag stops actually had a little mechanism, a paddle that you could raise or lower with a rope um, to uh, to get the train to stop. Or you could use a lighted newspaper at night, uh, which had uh, which I have read. So there's a beautiful um, view, aerial view, looking at Tower Station from Andrews Ledge, Andrus Ledge. Um, on the other side of the river, 
and there in the distance you can see the tower. Um, and um, I guess I try to clean that up a little bit, but there's the tower. The 1893, the 1892 um, topographic map shows the tower. That's probably where the station was, and there's the uh, Terrafil station. Um, he built the platform, put a cover over it later. Um, this is in 1891. That tower was built in 1889, um, the one that burned in 1936. Um, and then all trains will stop. Trains will stop at Bartlett Tower. Um, uh, again, a flag stop, not, not, a, not a regular stop. Uh, there's a nice view of the tower at its height, big observation platform, the tower itself, mm -hmm. billiards, uh, croquet, picnic tables, the whole nine yards. But in 19, 1898, Mrs. Antoinette Eno Wood of New York decides to buy it and basically close it to the public um, and use it as a family clubhouse. But she did allow tours. Um, there were newspaper articles about uh, whatever, uh, soci various societies uh, visiting up there, and she would serve tea uh, to, the, uh, to the visitors. Tower Blaze, 1936, visible for miles. So that was the end of that. Um, in terms of where Tower Station was today, the Google Earth map puts it here after more consultation with John yesterday. And at 60 Mountain Road, if you go up Mountain Road, well, that's Al Weaver's superimposition. Um, we kind of peg it where that sign, mileage sign to Bloomfield is. I mean, that, this is, you know, hit, give or take. But um, if you go up to 60 Mountain Road, there are gates, stone gates. We figure that was actually, the station was actually, most logically, at the closest point to Mountain Road that you could get to. Mountain Road, of course, was the only way into Terraville until 1955 when 189 was built. Um, so you had to come over the mountain. Um, and that point there where the station was is basically the closest to the track. So we figure that's where the station was, and it was opposite the Tunxus Bridge. So John and I pieced that together yesterday. At 60, again, there's the gates. So people probably walked up Mountain Road or got a carriage um, or walked through the gates up the path to the tower. And those gates were, are still there. Um, the Consolidated, in its greed, still continued to um, acquire more railroads. Um, and including the central New England, ironically, um, almost when this was happening in 1904. Um, the future of the Terrafield branch was, of course, immediately questioned and up for grabs. It lingered until uh, 1920. Um, of course, this person should be well known to you. He was the mastermind of all this acquisition. Um, uh, J.P. Morgan, of course, and Charles Mellon was the president of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford, who did everything that J.P. told him to do. Um, their follies are um, well chronicled in the book by John Weller, which is recommended reading. Um, so what happened to the station at Terraville? It was sold to, I have this list of stations, which I thought to consult, finally, sold on 4.30, where's, why can't I see the rest of this? Um, 4.30, 1938, to H. Freitag. Um, he bought the passenger station, he bought two of the section houses. The freight house was sold to somebody whose name I can't quite decipher, probably at the same time. Um, and Freitag bought another section house as well. What's that? Lewandowski. Lewandowski? You could see that? Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Okay. Um, does anybody know him? <laughs> uh, is he still around? Um, it, you know, it wouldn't be the first time that these buildings migrated to properties and they're still standing someplace, or they chopped them up and used them for firewood. Um, but 1938 was the end of uh, service completely on the, on the, uh, the CNE. Um, the last freight train was 
on July 1st to Feeding Hills from Hartford, and that was the end of it. The newspaper articles dated July 2nd. Uh, Connecticut Western closes a chapter. This was in The Current on uh, January of, of 1939 when the c &E was history. Um, we don't know exactly where the stop was, but the stop sign was, but um, might have been down at Griffin's where the track was cut and still operates as the um, present day Central New England Railroad today. My website is Tyler City Station. The end, or is it? The research still goes on. And as these guys are fond of saying, a question is sometimes the answer. If you, if you get my drift. Uh, I think I've run a little over my time, a little over my intended time, certainly. If there's um, a chance for a couple of questions. for coming this evening. I believe John Nagy would like to say something, but before he comes up, I'd just like to mention, um, Bob mentioned Carl Walter's canal maps. Um, it was featured quite often in the um, presentation, so we wanted to let you know that we have a series of nine maps of the entire canal that Carl Walters has put together and they're available for purchase. They're five dollars each or you can buy the whole collection of nine for about forty dollars. So you're welcome to come and see them. They're in the back on the table. But thank you again for coming. Do we have any time for questions or absolutely absolutely do. are there any questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, no, when the tracks were dismantled from the bridge where it went from Terrafield across the river to East Randy? Um, 1938, probably. So the tracks were dismantled right then when the railroad was abandoned? Um, yeah, there, you know, because service, again, we saw the last freight train was uh, 1938, June of uh, July 1st, 1938. So the track had to be in you know, to that point. When the bridge, when they, they probably took the bridge down at the same time that they were, you know, taking the rails up, which would be nice to get a newspaper article, you know, chronicling that to add to the, to the chronology. You know, actual, you know, they're out there doing it today kind of thing. Anything else? Yes, again. The photographs of that area, where would they be available? I'm sorry, which? The photographs of uh, where the bridge was, where the where this, uh, station was at the end of uh, Main Street Extension. The photograph. Yeah. Where, where are those photographs available? Are they? they um, I, they're available from me. Uh, I, I've, I've collected them from various sources over the years. Um, Simsbury Historical may have some. Um, Online. There may, you know, all kinds of stuff is showing up online. I mean, my stuff is showing up online when, without my permission, but, you know, you can't do anything about that nowadays. And I'm, I'm basically happy to share, um, you know, if credit is given to Tyler City Station, so much better, the better. But any, yes? Did the Central New England use the, uh, the big train station in Hartford that was also New Haven? Well, origin well, the Central New England, no. There was a separate, they built a separate station. The Hartford and Connecticut Western built that Hartford station with the dome on the end of it. I have pictures on my website, actually. Um, that, they built a separate station. Initially, the Connecticut Western did use Union Station in Hartford by backing up and, you know, kind of a Y arrangement. Um, so the stations that's there now, uh, the Connecticut Western did use originally. But in 1889, so 1871 to 1889, 1889, they built their own station because, you know, whatever. Because the, when was that? The Hartford station was built in 1889. That's probably why I think simultaneously they decided not to go into 
the new Union Station that the New Haven and the New York and New England were building jointly. So they decided to build their own. Because I, I think Union Station dates to 1889 also. So that there was kind of simultaneous development. Yes? The stone piles in back for Conros in the river. Yeah. That is where the accident happened, the train accident? No. The accident, if you go down, what's the name of the street? Yeah. yeah, but if you go into the complex and there's, there's an access point or an access path that the town, I guess, demanded of the condo developers, if you go down that path, I, you probably know where I'm talking There's two big boulders there. So if you go down to the river there, if you turn right and walk maybe, I don't know, a couple hundred feet, you come to the three stone pilings. That's the 1850 branch to Terraville. If you go in the other direction, when you get to the river, maybe two or three times the distance from the other one, uh, you come to the abutment that Bill was standing on. And that's where the bridge collapse took place. So frequent confusion. And the other confusion is that I've seen it mentioned <clears throat> here and there that when the Connecticut Western built, they used the 1850 alignment of the canal line to get to Simsbury. Totally false, as I think I've showed pretty clearly on the map. Entirely different right of way. The Connecticut Western, you know, sloped down like on a 45 degree angle um, instead of using the canal branch, which would have been kind of nonsensical to go above Simsbury and go down. So again, another confusion that, um, that I've come across that Unfortunately, with the internet, um, some, sometimes it's better to do this. Uh, uh, unfortunately, with the internet, uh, you know, you, you can't stop this stuff out. Once somebody puts something online, you know, who's going to correct it? And who, you know, where's, where's the true material, where's the true answer or the true facts? It, it's a real problem, you know, maybe not so much for railroad history, but um, other more serious matters as well. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I, I was interested in, um, I remember the tracks in front of the Simsbury Railroad Station. What, was that affiliated with Terrafell at all? Well, the, the, the two tracks, you know, I, I gave a talk here a couple of years ago on, on Simsbury proper and just, you know, tried to cover all the stations. Um, the tracks there, I believe, were taken out in the 80s. I would have to double check. I do have the Simsbury timeline on, on the computer. Uh, <clears throat> but tracks, tracks, you know, lasted there a lot longer. Um, you know, the canal line lasted in, into the late 80s, at least this far up, and then successively, you know, cut back down to Avon and then to Plainville um, and then Cheshire and Southington and, and uh, down there. So very easily you could remember tracks, tracks right there. Anybody else? Yes. Just to perhaps clarify, when we're talking about the condo building, I'm thinking when you say where the Terrafield station was and the factory building behind, I think you're referring to the three-story one building condo that is known as an Hayes Landing, and we're not talking about Governor's Bridge, which part of the Governor's Bridge abuts that. Range, so, yeah, two two separate locations. Yeah, the the end of um, the end of Main Street extended versus um, versus um, how you get to. I can picture how you get there. Uh, the relationship it, that's farther west. Basically, yeah, the, governor's the, the Governor's Bridge condos are. I think one of your maps even showed Whitewater Turn, which is the, one of the main. That, right, that's the way you get in. But that's um, where the station was, I think, is at the end of Main Street, was where the Hayes Landing <laughs> one building. Yes, right. That's two different condo right. things. Yep. Anybody else? Uh, yes. I, I just wanted to relay a story that I heard from my mom. Um, she passed away about seven years ago, and she would have been 96. Oh. Uh, but when she was a young girl, she lived in Simsbury, and um, 
she told me that she didn't remember trains running after 1938 across the bridge and up, but um, she assumed that was because of the flood, the 38. Um, 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 I, there, there was I, the. I didn't know that the history. I didn't realize that it was um, that things were changing and they, that they abandoned that branch anyway. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think the flood had any. Like Eleven or twelve at the time. Yeah. So. I, I, I don't think there's any connection. The, you know, the railroad was, uh, was, was finished. Uh, the New Haven were actually, well, the New Haven went into bankruptcy for the first time in 1935. So, uh, you know, they were looking to uh, cash in on real estate assets um, and, and discontinue service wherever, wherever they could. The hurricane of 38, of course, caused a lot of damage elsewhere, down on the shoreline uh, more so where, you know, miles of track were washed out. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure, the, did the Hurricane of 38 do as much damage up here as it did on the shore? I don't even know, 55 did, but uh, 38 did also, yeah. But uh, two, two I, I disconnected events, as far as I know. Anything else? I do have business cards up here, if you care to take one. John and Amy, real quickly. Yes. Uh, I'm John Nagy, I'm a Therapeutal Village Association, and this is my friend Sherry Landerman. And the village, the Therapeutal Village Association has uh, uh, had these blankets made uh, for fans of Therapeutal, a lot of Therapeutal images here. And the one uh, down on the bottom there is actually the So if you're looking at this, we'll be in this little room, and if you'd like to order one, just even look at it. Uh, there, they'll be $50. Thank you, Bob, for uh, all the walking. All the walking we have done and all the fun railroad stuff. Yeah, thank you, John, for, uh, for all your help. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.